karunaka o te mote rene o te waka wāraki koutou kaitahu whānui tēne te mihi ka te tautoko o koutou kūhini o koutou mana kia tātou manuhiri tū āraki no tērā taha o te moana nui a kiwa ka te tautoko nō o mihi ki tā rakatira o tā Māori i raro o te mau ko tēnei kaupapa, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou. Ko te tautoko nō o kūpū mō tātou tini aitua, he pauama e tauama a koutou, whae o koutou moi. A ku huru i hauki e koutou o te kanawe ora, tēnā koutou katoa. I'd far sooner be a living legend than a myth. I think I'm by gender designed for the former. I was enjoined by our niece Amy, who's a member of this course, to give her a note for this program to say what is it you are going to speak about. And late at night before flying out to a board meeting in Adelaide, um, I uh, uh, sat down in my pyjamas at the uh, spare screen that's out at uh, South Shore, and, and I wrote the note that's there. And I think if I was looking for a fundamental theme that I want to make to you in this context, because I've got to remember I'm not just talking about Naitahu, I'm talking about indigenous economies, and I'm talking about at a, 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 a pretty high level today, about a kaupapa. Uh, I wrote, if a tribal economy which is intergenerationally sustainable is to be achieved, it will never be accomplished by simply imitating the norms or the mantras of the surrounding models of liberal capitalism. The central concepts are fundamentally opposed to each other. Although we sail the same ocean, our voyaging requires different horizons and our own systems of navigation. If we merely imitate and emulate, we will end up on the comfortable shores of privatised welfare, dependent on corporations which we nominally own, but which in fact own us. And I have to say, when I was ruminating earlier this morning, as a consequence of the fire alarm which went off because of some spiders having got on it. And while my wife was sorting that out, I came to the conclusion I couldn't do much better if I was looking for a message to deliver than what I wrote the other night uh, uh, at the request of uh, somewhat insistent demands coming through my email uh, from our niece. But before I get into that theme, uh, I have to also uh, remind myself not to be careful, because, uh, I'm sorry, not to be too careful, but at the same time to be proper. It's wrong for me to stand here amongst you and talk about the issues which have made me grumpy in recent years. Uh, to talk about the instances and the cases of the very significant opportunities that we in Naitahu, and I've watched other tribes do this, have lost. <coughs> I'm always reminded of the fact, and I'm going to give you an allegory about this in a moment, from the 1980s, just so that no one here can feel too sensitive about being stuck with some of these things. We... we in the political and economic model which we all belong to, wealth is routinely destroyed. And the people who destroy it are never accountable for it. Right? They never acknowledge the accountability. They don't, quite often they don't even know they've done it. But we routinely destroy huge amounts of wealth. <coughs> and 
The worst offender in the New Zealand economy is the state itself. And we tend, in our behaviour, because New Zealanders are uh, hooked on the state, even though they might resent their addiction, they're basically hooked on it, we tend to imitate them continually. And I have watched Naikahu make decisions which have resulted in huge amounts of wealth not realised, which is the equivalent of destroying it turning down opportunities, but I watch other people doing this, I watch the state doing it. And imitating the models around us is only going to lead us into more and more of that behaviour. And so I, I've entitled what I want to speak to you about as horizons of our own. That we've got to have a different strategy as indigenous, running, developing the indigenous economy uh, from the standard model around us. Now, I would not like you to think that at any time I want to run down the importance of being able to pay for the groceries. We're always going to have, we're going to have to pay for the fuel, and we're going to have to pay for the groceries, we've got to have ordinary cash flow, we've got to manage those things. But if we do not have a longer term strategy to achieve what very few other cultures have ever satisfactorily achieved, that is intergenerational maintenance of capital. Right? Even the great German com family companies you know, are only about by the fourth generation they're being sold into the market. If this dream of intergenerational wealth and in the maintenance of intergenerational capital to support a long-term future for us as tribal peoples, if that's to be made real, the one thing we cannot do is build models which are simply <coughs> imitative of the standard norms around us. I'm a distinguished fellow of the Institute of Directors. I have sat listening to the discussions on governance for years. I'm yet to hear them seriously address issues of performance. We're all talking about governance. At, at a certain level, at a certain level, we all become control freaks. Not necessarily out of uh, some sort of power mania. That's got well, its fair maximum. I've got something to say about that, briefly, <laughs> shortly. It's not, but for most people who find themselves in positions of responsibility take their responsibility seriously. But, on the whole, the first thing they do is smack on the controls, go, what, what, you can't do it? Uh, my most recent example is a thing that Tainui and Naikahu have received a lot of praise for, the recent buyback of Ryman shares. I wasn't going to, oh, this is the only one of these I'll mention. <laughs> I said to Wally Stone yesterday, uh, I told him what part of his anatomy should be attended to uh, with my talk at all, and <laughs> at what particular angle, because I argued to him that Tainui did not pay a sufficient premium to Naitahu for Naitahu's, the use of Naitahu's right of first refusal in that transaction. Now, it's a brilliant transaction, but we should have, if we had systems which could approve things faster and better and do that, we should have made, collectively, a hell of a lot more out of those uh, predatory Australians. <laughs> right? It was, and it, it's, but the reason we didn't was because we were working within our uh, directors, were working within the constraints of a set of rules which are basically built on fear. They're not built on a positive forward movement. That's what I love about working in South Australia, where the bottle is always half full. <coughs> Here, it's always half empty. There, we're talking about risk management. I come home, and we're talking about risk avoidance. And it's, it's a different state of mind. And I believe, whatever I think about what the New Zealand economy is going to do, we've got to start thinking very differently. Now, in order to avoid um, digging over some of the things